And I'm from John Marshall in Atlanta. And you're also right. Yeah. And I'm not a writer. Uh, but uh, I've walked through this with people who were lawyers. Uh, and so the, 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 the two parts of this, as I say, one part is that it shows how to show do condition text. Because the first part, whoops. Shows the original public license, mm -hmm. uh, and the second part shows an essay by uh, Baldwin, who's a professor at Columbia. Um, and you can get rid of that, or get rid of the first part, or you can add commentaries to yourself. And I was hoping somebody would come here, and um, if you wanted, to, if you were to give permission, we could take your words, which wouldn't do anything, you know, which would be easy for you to do, and make another commentary, and have it as a conditional thing that would come in. Um, and that's the technology, which is fairly simple. The public license itself is a very, is a document that as far as I know, ah, uh, is, uh, why do you come here? There are there, there, not many, and, and we're just going to walk, we're actually, it's, it's actually going to be fairly detailed. Oh, do you have a copy? It makes more sense. And there, may, there should be a copy in your, uh, right, but he should have one in his, in his bag. Sure. Yep, and there was one in, uh, in every single bag, theoretically. It's a good one. It's a good one. It wasn't my bag, however, so not every bag has it. No, actually, I had it, but I didn't bring it. Ah, okay. But, so uh, what I was just saying is that, that, that this thing shows several different technologies from the same source. One, for example, is the info, which is what you see here. And uh, when I'm able to speak, uh, which is the case of speech and the same. Not possible. Not possible. Not possible. Not possible. Not possible. Not possible. See, and so that would be useful if you were driving a car. And you don't want a person reading while you drive. You want to have someone to listen. This is a program that... Uh, yeah, in other words, when you write uh, a document or produce software, uh, you can listen to it. You can put it in HTML, which is... Uh, it's this one. Yeah, this is a web page, and it shows it in HTML. In other words, it's a slightly different layout format, but the same words, the same content. Uh, you can print it. This, this is the example of printing. Right. Whoops. Well, we got the print out here. Well, you got the print out there. That's the example. Uh, and, uh, and you can do it in info, which is what this is, which is either very fast for visual look at, lookers, and, and it has an advantage over HTML or web page, in that web pages. You can search within a web page very comfortably, but you don't know. Thank you. I think we've done everything. Pardon me? I, I, thank you much. Okay. This is this is on the screen now is info. Is that what you're yeah. And and, and you can you can have it speak to you. Info does the speech as well. No, it's Emacs speak is doing the speech. Yeah. Emacs speak. Emacs is there there are four different user interfaces. The one you're probably most familiar with is the graphical. Uh, there's also the old command line, which is still quite convenient. Um, then there's Emacs, which is essentially a virtual list machine designed for visually oriented people, uh, which is basically how I think it. I mean, it fits in with the graphical stuff. And there's Emacs Speed, which is actually based on Emacs, which is a virtual list machine, except it has a quite different concept. It's an audio desktop, not a visual desktop. And a lot of screenwriters screen readers that people use are actually just convert the text on a screen to uh, speech uh, and simply are not uh, are not uh, let's say I'm going to take all this off um, maybe um, and uh, they aren't the same as a, as a blind person with them um, and that's the, that's the issue that uh, uh, Raman, who was blind, who wrote Emacs Speed, came up with. And what he did was he adapted 
Emacs, which is a generic, as they say, virtualist machine, which includes the Mac And uh, created a desktop which is somewhat fit, which, which he, as he points out, is different than uh, what a visual person uses. Now, I tend to use it as an Emacs with a little bit of voice added. But the thing about if you're permanently blind, or if you're driving a car and has more situation of blind or whatever, is that you're basically getting your information in a one-dimensional stream, sequential information. Now, the thing that, so you have to remember how things go, or you may have to go down sequentially to things. Now, what also happens is this is slow speech. It's the same as human speech. Uh, but it turns out that people who use this sort of thing over several days, without consciously trying to, can pick up faster and faster speeds so that they shortly become able to understand what to me is garble um, at 500 words a minute, as fast as you can read, visually. Uh, and at 500 words a minute, then, it becomes very reasonable to use an audio desktop. It's not so reasonable when it's at 180 words a minute or whatever it is. Now, uh, we speak normally. I don't want to distract you from the meeting. No. The point no. is, but you talk about an audio desktop. Yep. If you're talking about the, uh, an alternative to the desktop, my desktop right. shows me a pack of icons. Right. And this is if a complete it was different audio, audio. Would they just say Windows icon? No. It would, would if, it would if an audio screen reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it's if it's a different desktop, this makes some funny noises, you know, when you go to a new file or whatever. <coughs> um, but you don't. Know how to you don't talk to it. No. It speaks to you. The talking to it, the voice recognition stuff, hasn't got that part. <laughs> but I mean, why do you call it a desktop if you can't tell it? Where you want it to go. Why but you can tell it where you want it to go by typing. Ah, okay, so but if you're blind. If you're blind, you see you have to be able to type. If you're blind, you cannot uh, see see where your icon where your cursor is. Okay, so you give it you give it like dot commands for it, right? The equivalent of that, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so that, that then you can shift for example I can shift forward uh, And you notice that it then tells me what each cent, each line is. So if I were blind and not looking at it, what rate is this at? Pretty slow. Yeah, but I can understand it sometimes. Well, it, 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 if, you, if you have, um, uh, maybe we should, no, probably not on this one. If you, if you, you can, it'll, it is able to read. Well, let me just do it. Uh, you can set it so that it uh, has different voices. Like if you put an emphasis uh, on what would be italics in a printed thing, you can have uh, a different voice that gives emphasis. And if you had bold and the printed, you can have yet another voice. Uh, it comes across from both. Uh, and uh, that actually can be quite useful. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking of it because I went to a, a, a meeting on, on uh, uh, well, the electronic case books, which they keep trying to correct up and never works out. But if you were a student of a program like that, mm -hmm. that could play it in the car, yeah. uh, would come to the and then, prepared fewer times. Yes. And the other thing is that the same input can also produce the printed text, and you can make that conditional so that if somebody in Massachusetts has a slightly different version of the law than somebody in Texas, and you're teaching in Massachusetts rather than Texas, Texas, you can choose the case for your or the law for your state if you want to. Uh, if you don't like a commentator, you can just not include it, which is very useful. If you like a commentator, you can include it. Uh, and as I say, you can do it for the printing. You can do a slightly different format for your website. You can do a slightly different format for your uh, listening. Uh, you can also actually listen on HTML, but I haven't done that much. So I wasn't going to show it. Uh, and uh, so you have a choice of the different things. 
that you can do. And that's nothing to do with the general public license, but it is easy to it's easy it's easy to create and but there aren't the surface technologies yet ready. Um, but uh, uh, I know there's more that could be done over time. And oh, this is good. I was going to show. I was going to show this too. Uh, you can pick up these because I have them on my rattlesnake website, which is easy to remember. Rattlesnake. Uh, this one shows. This is more of a how-to. Uh, and now, one of the things I want people to do is to create better user interfaces. Oh, this is one of these um, But the point is, most of the stuff that one does now is just for printing. And uh, it's coming into the idea of having it also for a website. But the truth is you really want at least the three things, the printing, the visual website, and the listening. And technology is there. It's not very good, but it's there. It's better if you're willing to spend a lot of money uh, for, you know, for a separate text to speech that decides it. But apparently, the current you buy, often buy, a thousand dollars pop or whatever. You should kind of do a really great job. Uh, but I just use the software that's really available. You're, uh, you're uh, sort of presuming a world where people who spend a lot of time. Together. No. Well, uh, I mean, the car is a, is a good example. Myself. But I know that, um, that there are people who do. And, uh, I mean, as far as the importance of this, uh, this audio, mm -hmm. automatic audio version of I mean, it's an interesting magic, but if you take a student, say, at a uh, state university mm -hmm. uh, in law school, and he may be uh, living there. To be living where he goes and now, yeah. went to the University of Michigan. My, my but then the classrooms uh, were uh, adjacent to my living place. And right, but do you ever drive long distances? Rarely. Mm -hmm. Never by choice. The thing I'd like to point out is that, uh, you know, you just mentioned the use of automobiles, but I think there are other instances. For instance, look at the use that's being made of the iPod and people downloading yes. music. You know, let's say something oh, goes out for a dog, iPod, you way. know, I want to, you know, you want to read your cases for the day. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't mind listening to them, yeah. it's, it's one way of doing it. Yeah. Or, you know, anything that's exercise, eating, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, anything where you've got your eyes engaged, Mm -hmm. And but you're really not doing too much thinking. I think yeah. it'd, it'd be useful. Then. Yeah, that's basically. I mean, it's just it's, it's, it's just another medium, and it's a medium that's not technically possible. And the iPad is a good example because I don't. I never thought of the iPad. I don't have an iPad. I don't care about that sort of thing. Uh, but I know this would be possible to have it read and put stuff into an iPod, and then you'd be ready for the cases for the day. Uh, I don't know how to do it immediately. I could probably figure it out in half an hour to an hour. It's not hot either, but I'm just putting out a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any idea? Noise doesn't have to be like really sunny. No. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, well, you can see what the quality of it is. This is a kind of dull. It's, it's not the greatest. Because uh, we use a different, a slightly different style. I'm not going to use my redemption of doing this as well. We can expect the nonsense to define it. Uh, and, uh, there is another program called Dragon. Uh, Dragon Speak. That's for yeah. speaking too. This is yeah. text to speech. This is from from it. Won't be able to hear a thing. 
but that does way to hear me much better actually. Weird. Okay. So when it was plugged in, the speaker testing was probably cut out. Ha. Okay. Oh well. Uh, I have to be quiet. So I'm just thinking. <laughs> I, I, I bet I have to keep this thing on in order for him to record this thing. Uh, <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, that's it's a digression, but it's it's an interesting digression. You can do all these different things readily, and the point is there be are drivers and there are other people exactly as you said, uh, where where you. They don't want to be eyes on. They may not want to be mind on either, but they don't mind listening. Uh, and you can also do the printing. You can do efficient online uh, reading and writing, which is the thing about HTML is that if you have a one page, you can search through it and navigate rapidly through it. But HTML intrinsically does not know the difference between a cross reference inside the document on another page, electronic page, and outside the document. So you can't go from page to page to page. And I should close that door. I just realized that. Sorry about that. Um, so that's what's wrong with HTML. And when Berners-Lee first invented HTML, he was thinking in terms of electronic pages at CERN, and that they would require diagrams and pictures and tables. So he did really good for producing pictures and tables, uh, and text, or text. Uh, and of course people love pictures, because the previous stuff that existed for bringing stuff over the web was designed basically for text. Yeah? And I'm oriented toward text, I remember thinking, hmm, text, that's what's important, I don't care about pictures. Uh, but in fact, what most people like, or at least enough people like, to take it up a lot is pictures. Uh, it's just the psychology of humans. Uh, so that's so HTML boom. Not a lawyer. Hmm? Not a lawyer. But not a lawyer. Well, maybe not a lawyer. That's good. Uh, fit man, not like that. But anyhow, so that's the story about uh, producing multiple outputs, multiple endings. Uh, and if you want, we can go through the actual uh, license here. Well, and you can have questions. How about the high level overview? I mean, the point of this license is uh, basically to assure credit and to assure uh, uh, that further developments are also public. Well, well that's, that's true. Uh, in a sense, the highest level thing is to figure out how can you use an old law, which is what copyright is, to protect me, protect people in new conditions and how can you protect people in new conditions in a way that nobody can steal, perhaps legally, but is felt by the writer, the creator, to be immoral? Uh, and that's the difference between putting things in the public domain or using BSD, a virtual standard distribution license, which is another famous license, which gives part of the same rights but doesn't have the obligation to pass on the rights. So that means that if you wrote a legal paper and made a trivial error, and gave the wrong citation, so just typing error, and I fixed it, I could prevent you from ever using that correction. Well, in that case, you couldn't, it would be fair use. But, 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 but if it were, if it were, if it were a bit longer than, you know, a bit longer than fair use, I, I, made, I made a change, uh, then I could prevent you from uh, uh, using that. Unless... I, I don't think so, because your, your, uh, your addition to the work would be the, itself the creation of... Oh, you're saying my work is in the public domain? Uh, public domain or under, uh, under license which doesn't require... which I can take from you and not give anything back, and I have the legal right not to. Yeah, yeah. my work is in copyright. Yeah. Uh, then your, your addition mm -hmm. is copyrighted uh, which protects the words you've used, but the idea of the correction, the, the, the concept that you mm -hmm. have used to correct, I can take yeah. from that and, and sure. phrase it myself. And, and yeah, I mean, you can work around with, with that, but that takes a lot of effort, and it may be that uh, then if it's not only copyright, it becomes a patent issue, which has to do with ideas, mm -hmm. you know, and with, 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 uh, with something written that doesn't matter so much. Yeah, I think this works better in the family. Well, this, this, was, this was designed, it 
GNU General Public License was designed specifically for software. There's also the uh, GNU uh, Free Documentation License, but it's more complex, and this is an easier thing to look at. Documentation would cover the software documentation. Yes. I mean, yeah. Which which then it's applies. It's text, but it's a very special. But it, ha but it has the, thing, the characteristics of, of anything that's written, which includes software, which includes poems, which includes introductions, which includes the body of, documenta of documentation, are all different from a human point of view, but are all the same from a computer's point of view. They're all bits. But from a human point of view, there's some things that you want to have invariant. In other words, if you write a poem, or if you write an introduction, or if you write a commentary, you probably don't want somebody else changing it on you and saying that, oh, uh, Michael has written this and it's exactly the opposite of what you've actually written. And you want to be able to claim damages against him if he does it. Uh, and it's a, it's a fraudulent, it's a form. It, but it, uh, the advantage of having a, a legal system that enables that is if it, you have a government on your side as an ally, uh, which is useful. Um, Otherwise, you have to depend on the clubs you're planning on family. Um, There's a reverse situation of that that I've uh, mm -hmm. heard objections to. I'm not sure whether they're uh, uh, spurious or not, but um, we hear various software companies. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have, if I mistake a bit, mm -hmm. of GNU code mm -hmm. in our software, mm -hmm. it's viral. That's not called viral, it's called our vaccination. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, but, but let's go the other way around and say, ah, I have just written some code, which I have done, yeah. and you take it from me. Now, if you take it from me, and I've licensed it in such a way that I'm going to require something from you, it's not my doing a viral infection of you, it's my vaccinating myself against you stealing it from me. And the whole idea of using the word viral, which is one kind of metaphor, versus yeah. the idea of using the word vaccination, which is another metaphor, is very much a spin or PR type mechanism. Yeah. Uh, and if, suppose, let's do the reverse. Suppose uh, you have written some code you don't want me to use, and you want to restrict it, and I take it. And if I take it, do I have the right to use it? And you say no, and you've done all the legal things to say no? Oh no, I don't have any right to take it. And uh, I think you, you should feel upset if, uh, uh, if I took it from you. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing. And the whole point about viral versus vaccination is that it's different kinds of propaganda, basically. A PR or a spin, however you want, whatever terms you want to use. Um, and so that means that if you are writing restricted code, and you don't want anybody to see it, and then you type some of my code, which I have said, ah, sure, you can use if, but only if you're willing to return that code and any changes you make. Uh, and your work suddenly becomes a, a uh, drive of work of mine, and you don't do anything, then I'm gonna feel that you've stolen from me. Uh, and this, and, 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 and under American law, under copyright law, you have stolen from me. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's not only it's not only a, a moral feeling I have; it's also a legal a legal feeling. And the whole thing about copyright is that it really is based on a license where you don't have. A ch it's not like a contract where you can go back and forth. It's a license. I can ban you if I want. You don't have any choice. Uh, and that's a critical issue here. Uh, so, have I answered this? I'm trying to see. Your first question was to give the overview. And I said that some of the things you talked about were, but I was trying to talk about other things and I got somewhat distracted. I'm trying to figure out if I've answered enough of your questions in the overview. Oh, problem. Okay. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, but I want to just jump past unless you get really excited, is that if you can return things to other people, in other words, if, you, if, if it's strictly the case where you can come and take stuff from me, which is what public domain stuff does, then the advantage is to you. If you uh, have a situation where if you take stuff from me, then you have to be able to give it back to me, then the advantage is to both of us. And you have a more evolutionary, stable strategy that way, 
or you have an evolutionary state, stable strategy where you can't take anything from me and I can't take anything from you. Uh, you can either have too low and no cooperation or too high. And it's the middle one where you can take from me but I can't take from you, which puts me in defeat. And that's essentially what the public domain and the BSD license uh, do. They, they, they're unstable from an, in, a, in a game theory. Thing. And I don't know if anybody cares about game theory or knows much about it. But it's, I found it very <laughs> convincing. This going into. And the point is, who can gain benefits from somebody else becomes in a social situation amongst various different companies and lawyers and countries even, uh, becomes very significant. In the situation you're suggesting, where you just recover, mm -hmm. he, he then takes it under your license, adds some valuable code to that. Mm -hmm. With respect to you, mm -hmm. uh, the, at the next, the situation then mm -hmm. looks somewhat, I guess, like the situation of joint authors, and if either of you can now exploit it. Yes. Uh, or it's like lawyers working with the uh, with the freely redistributable legal case. Now, in the case of joint authors, mm -hmm. either one can exploit it, either one can license it. Mm -hmm. uh, such an obligation would come to the other for mm -hmm. profits. What's the, the, your well, well, well in, 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 this case, in this case, I write something valuable, and you take the use of it. And I said, you could use it. And you can sell it, and, and we don't have to jointly um, deal with profits. But this says specifically is that if you want to sell it for a million dollars, and somebody's willing to pay you that, which they aren't likely to, but if they are, they can pay you the million dollars, and you can go away with it, and I don't get anything. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I can sell the same thing, which means that it's good for the buyer because he then negotiates between us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's unlikely that either of us will make a million dollars. But we might make something else, uh, because I might do something which in, improves my reputation, or gets me a job somewhere, or that I sell to somebody. Uh, and you might do the same thing with your add-ons, um, and uh, that could be useful. Uh, it's it's like a, it's like a lawyer, uh, you know. It's so slightly is, a different case, but this applies to creative programmers. They pass things around, each mm -hmm. of them trying to exploit them to the to the uh, to the, to the best that they can do it. Yeah, uh, uh, they can't do any of this shit. But then they all they work together. They improve the product, and everybody that's improved the product, uh, the one with the sales personality, has to make profit from it. And yes. The one who's the, the in the in the back yeah. office, they're going to be going to make any money. That's correct. That's correct. But that is also that already the way the world is. Except yeah, that sure. this is this is uh, this gives more people the opportunity to uh, try to improve to to get. Rewards in some way. It may be that the guy in the back office gets a good reputation as someone who is a good programmer. Yeah, with the people that are good at the sales. So yeah. the next time they say, instead, ah. of, instead of writing this shit that he improved so much for me, I'm just going to start out with having him write it and I'll sell it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah. that seems like a real wonderful model. Yeah. And then the next, the next part of it is, uh, is that there's a lot of stuff where people are willing to do it basically at no charge to the rest of us. That's not the dull, boring, and hard stuff. It's the exciting, interesting, and small stuff. And if you were... Uh, Is there a good example of that? Well, the GNU Linux system. Because I, I actually raised and spent about $5 million hiring people to do things like computer drivers. Uh, what we call libraries. Oh, GNU is a, is a Linux. Uh, 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 GNU is a, a Linux is a kernel which yeah. the GNU system has. Linux is a small portion of it, which expanded its name uh, because the fellow GNU who, is like is a is a parallel to Red Hat. And, and no, Red Hat is a is a, is a derivative work of GNU Linux. Red Hat is a, a particular uh, distributor of a operating system of which the kernel is Linux. And the whole set of programs, everything put together, including all the other stuff, uh, like your open office and like your web servers and all that, is a GNU system. Okay, GNU but, 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 has, has but, 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 but Linus happens to be a much nicer fellow than Stallman, who invented all this. Uh, 
and Stallman called it GNU. Uh, but Linus being a much nicer fellow, I have to tell you, uh, since I've known Richard. Uh, Linus got himself the big name, yeah. but he actually didn't invent this, mm -hmm. and he didn't do most of the work. In other words, we had done most of the work even before he started writing his kernel. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an actual conscious decision made in 1985-86 to put the kernel last, uh, basically because it was felt it would be straightforward to do the kernel, uh, unless you did an experimental one, which is what the FSF funded, I think, at the state. Uh, and uh, you could do a bunch of the other things, and then, bingo, you'd have it. And Linus came along, he wrote a good enough kernel in 92, and he's, as I say, a much nicer fellow. Uh, so people liked it. And he put it under the GNU General Public License, his work, and he used the other, all the stuff that we done, which is more than 85% of the code. Uh, and a lot of it's getting very boring to do. Uh, what, what, does the, uh, what does the other code in the, oh, in the Linux kernel, what does the other code Oh, do? what it does, for example, is suppose you're adding 2 plus 2. Mm -hmm. You have to have an arithmetic, what we call a library, an arithmetic library. Uh, suppose you're displaying on a screen. Uh, suppose you're editing something. Suppose you're writing a word document. Uh, suppose you're displaying a document. Uh, the main, okay. so the, the, the main thing is the kernel. Like the interface to the public. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a whole bunch of different interfaces, but that's one of the uh, things you do. The, the, the kernel, what it does is it manages the memory, the, the random access memory. It manages the hard disk stuff. It controls access to different parts so that you can have more or less security in different parts, which is useful. Uh, and it does one other thing, and I can't remember what it is. Uh, oh, and it also interfaces to various, um, although the original Linux kernel didn't do a very good job, it interfaces to a, a bunch of different object, uh, what do you call them? Uh, devices. So, so this license is the way in which the Linux broadly understood yeah. to do this new stuff. This is the way that it uh, organizes the contributions of the Lots of people. They're kicking in stuff to this thing for the honor of yeah. having their thing accepted. Well, that's part of what it is. And it's true. And the point is it's a social organization because there are other, there are other licenses, of which the BSD, Berkeley Sand Distribution, uh, also provide ways to organize it. The BSD license, which was basically paid for by the U.S. tax, U.S. taxpayer paid for, the, for Berkeley to do improvements to Unix in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And so Berkeley and University of California then distributed, so they put it under their license, which is called the BSD license. But effectively, it's paid for by American taxpayers. And the thing about the BSD license is that someone, well, Microsoft, to take a good example, can take a partial part of it, and in their case, it was all the networking stuff, and put it into their code, into their operating system. Uh, and use it, and not help anybody to give any, any, any results back. Well, isn't Apple basically FreeBSD that's... Uh, and Apple's FreeBSD, uh, which is... Which well is, developed and... Yeah, and, and, it's very, and that's one reason that the modern Apple OS X is so stable, because it has an operating system, an underlying operating system, and kernel has been going on for more than 20 years now. It's been you know, worked on by lots of people who have really cleaned things up. You know, all the, a lot of the little things that, have got, that can go wrong, you know, eventually appear after 10, 15 years of use, uh, and then gets fixed. Uh, and the reason Apple picked it was because, uh, well, first because it's very stable, and secondly because they could do what they wanted with it without necessarily having to give it back. Now, there is a lot of pressure, social pressure on them to give things back, but as you guys probably know, there's a difference between social pressure preventing someone from <coughs> behaving illegally and law and enforcement and trials be preventing somebody from behaving, well, not illegally. They can behave immorally and they can behave illegally. And you have a stronger 
force if you can take them to court. Um, so this BS, uh, DSP... DSD, Berkeley DSD. Standard Distribution. But it's, it's, like, it's like a public domain in, in many ways. Once you go beyond the first stage. But it is a, it's an equivalent of Linux except that it can become proprietary yes. as soon as you modify yeah. it. Yeah, uh, 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 the BSD, the various BSD, they're basically Unixes, and, and the reason GNU is invented as its name is GNU is not Unix, meaning effectively it didn't have the same legal restrictions, or in those days all the Unixes had lots of legal restrictions, now they stopped having them, um, and they become much more... Uh, but Unix is owned, isn't it? Well, Unix itself, everything's owned, this is owned. I own, I own this, as a matter of fact. But I've licensed it in certain ways, which is a different thing. Uh, what you're saying is Unix is restricted, and some of the Unixes, maybe the word Unix, refers to code that is in fact restricted by the various of the licensees of AT and T or whatever. Uh, the FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and NetBSD are not restricted in that sense. They can be converted into restricted. But they're not intrinsically themselves that. Darwin, which is what the free BSD was converted yeah. into for uh, uh, Apple, is in itself not restricted, but Apple itself can. But are, did you not say that these are developments of Unix? But they're all, yeah, the, the, those, the the all the BSDs. Should, code, well, what happened is that AT&T originally wrote Unix. Then, AT&T, because it was a uh, regularized monopoly telephone system, was not allowed to commercialize its computer development stuff. Uh, so initially, which would be the early 70s when we first started working on this, uh, you could get tapes at the cost basically, it was basically $200. That's what it did. And everybody agreed that that was a fair price you know, for having somebody copy the tape and make it and ship it out. Yeah, but that would have all happened to the rights. And what happened then, ah, is that all the people in universities in particular never thought about rights. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but AT&T cleverly kept them. Yeah. And then AT&T discovered, ooh, well first we've been broken up a bit so that uh, one part or other, and I can't remember which parts are which. Uh, then suddenly had the right to uh, restrict its use and charge a huge amount for it, firstly. Uh, and uh, so, and they did. So that's part one. Part two is that in the time when this stuff was not much commercialized, and not com uh, commercialized in the sense of huge profits, restricted profits, because what I want to say is that, you know, the people who, like lawyers, who are certainly commercial, uh, and who make money, but who work with a freely redistributable thing. So they're commercial, but they're not restricting themselves necessarily. The, uh, not in the, during this period when people thought of it as unrestricted, even if it was technically restricted, the government came in and subsidized and paid for, the U.S. military to be more precise, uh, a whole bunch of things which is part of Berkeley. And there, there's a huge growth. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, the parts that were not by the U.S. government, which were, but were originally done by AT&T, were rewritten because it was under a copyright with different expressions and such, so that it wouldn't be under AT&T uh, AT by various people. Sure. And that's how you created the NetBSD, the FreeBSD, the OpenBSD, and the Darwin. Because that would be certainly, uh, that looks just like a target for well, there was a huge period of litigation, as a matter of fact, in the early 90s. Uh, and the people who have argued that uh, they had done something that is, in fact, different won. Oh, this, and the argument against it would be that this is paraphrased. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and they won. And, and uh, since right. then, and, and what they did is they, they released, uh, they, they put their paraphrases, if you might want to call it that, under a BSD license. Mm -hmm. uh, and I forget who is what, but uh, I think one of the modern purchasers who has the the court thing came out in favor of those doing the open net and uh, 
FreeBSD stuff. But the actual, part of the actual answers were kept secret for a long time. And I just, and I don't care about it. So, uh, other than the fact that I provided support for one guy when we thought that he was going to create a kernel that was different from Lima's kernel, and so we were busy uh, balancing that. Uh, other than that, I, I didn't care much about the PSD. Uh, because it's basically unstable, because you, you, can, you can proprietize it. So the, the, the BSD license, uh, is, do you think that it is the way it is because they didn't think about requiring no. the developments, or was that just the intention? That I think, I think the, the intention, the intention was of the, the, of, the, of the U.S. military, of our province in particular, was to subsidize the large, soft, the large computer companies, which all happened to be American at the time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, uh, Bell people, um, IBM, Hewlett Packard, um, and there are some others. Um, and they figured this would be a great way to subsidize them. And it would be done indirectly. And they would subsidize them in a way that they thought would be useful for the military eventually, which is that they would do more networking. Um, and that was that was their that's that was their initial thing was was to make the networking better. Uh, and they were right, as it happens, uh, networking has become very important not only for the military but even for the rest of us. Uh, so that's that was that was why it was done, and I think it was a very conscious intent to provide that kind of system. Um, you had a question, yes. I have a question, probably kind of unrelated. Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, we have a lot of, see a lot of developments on the Linux and, mm -hmm. and everything else. Who really pays for that? Who pays the developers? Usually it's a university, a government, a large corporation. For example, take IBM. IBM sells services at the rate of about $20 billion a year and sells hardware at some high rate also. From its point of view, it wants to reduce its complementary, the cost of complementary products. Uh, a good example is suppose you own an airplane, that you, uh, uh, an airline, and you fly people from Chicago to Miami. You want the price of hotel rooms in Miami to go down because then you can carry more passengers. So that's, that's why so companies pay for it. But let me, let me finish this because it's, it's a big deal. The second thing is that universities can do this because universities are famous for having scholars do stuff. Uh, a third is you can have governments do it. A fourth is that we are actually richer now than we used to be. And it's become so much cheaper to do things. There are people who are willing to do this for you without cost. But the truth is it's mostly the exciting and small things. OK. So what percentage of this development for the community comes from people that do it for fun. I, I just no, I, I, I understand. I actually I don't know. I don't know. In 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 about when we were first developing the new Linux around about 1989, uh, I figured that we had about 17 people paid, and we had full time and equivalents, uh, and we had and I don't remember how many of these we would count as full time equivalents, but we had some 600 volunteers. So. For that part of it, the, clearly the majority of it was created by people who we didn't have to pay. Now most of them were working for other organizations. You know, some were running, you know, warehouses, and they were, did a good job in running the warehouse, so they didn't have to work much, so they could do something else. Others were working for universities, um, and they did this scholarly work. Others were working for IBM and Exxon, to take several good examples. Some were working for Banks uh, and Wall Street. Because I remember having so it's in everybody's thing. interest not to have Microsoft be able to turn your computer off. Correct. And well, no, it's not in everybody's interest. It's in the interest of the owners of Microsoft to be able to restrict their sales and to get high prices for those they do sell, and to have the cost of enforcing that offloaded on the taxpayers. Yeah, but we. we but for everybody else, when, it doesn't as, as, the, as the license deals with Microsoft become more mm. intrusive, yes. as, that, as that happens, everybody's interest in the development of mm -hmm. Linux or other alternatives yeah. goes way up. Yes. So it's, it's, uh, 
it, it seems like there ought to be a, a, a curve line here where uh, it becomes more and more possible to leave. Yes, that's and that's what I see, and, and I actually see that. It's just that there are two parts of it. One is that I see it uh, in, in, in my life a lot. Uh, and I haven't used anything from Microsoft since 1987 as it happens. Uh, and nobody in the legal business has to, but what happens is that it's, everything takes longer than, when, than I would have thought. And what happens is you have habits, individual habits, and you have then, what you have in, in a lot of law schools, for example, is you have people getting software, which then ties in, they don't even think of that, because they don't know enough about software, and they don't think that it ties into one thing versus another. Um, I had dinner last night with a fellow who's doing Extegrity, that's it called, Zap for um, And basically, from his point of view, um, yes, it's, that looks like it. Great, yeah. Uh, he is producing Xam software that primarily makes use of Microsoft stuff. And the reason is it's easy for him to do that. Uh, it's, uh, he's actually selling a service, but he doesn't sell it as a service, he sells it as a product because it's easy for people to think in terms of buying shirts rather than think in terms of hiring lawyers, although it seems very odd for law schools to think that way, but that's how they do. Uh, because as he says, I have, he, he and his programmer and such have to keep up with things and have to keep making changes, so effectively what they're doing is selling a service they, and, doing, and doing things for the law schools. So he's presuming that all that the law schools are going to be using Microsoft as Yeah, their, as their and then it's worked and it's likely to work for the next couple of years maybe. Uh, it, it, and but it seems like at every law school, so that, that's another very comment. many law schools, the guys that are charged with systems would like to be away from Microsoft. Yeah. But everybody has Microsoft at home. Well, not everybody, but many people do. Everybody that's, that has no expertise yeah. at all. And, and so what happens there is that you start that you have it, there's a tran transition cost of shifting away from it. And now, this is where I actually would have thought that there would have been more effort by people like IBM to make home users make lower the cost of transitioning away. Uh, but they haven't. In fact, IBM ended up selling its, uh, its laptop division uh, to a Chinese firm, Chinese government. That's true. Huh? That's exactly what I heard. It wasn't true. Yeah, no, it really is true. Uh, but whoever's selling laptops. I mean, every, every maker of laptops, Microsoft is getting a big chunk of what's available yeah. to pay for your laptop. Yes, and, and what Microsoft did, which was, I think, a really ingenious bit of business, was they recognized that, there's, that the people they sold to, their customers, are different from their end users. Their customers are primarily the buyers of these of companies like Dell. Yeah. Uh, but their end users, and, and then Dell sells the stuff to end users. So they produce something that the end users can do, which is very convenient, very nice, which is why one of the reasons I have these gas is security problems, uh, because they never thought of that ahead of time. Uh, and also they think in terms of networking. Yeah? Microsoft and the others have a very big interest in fixing vulnerabilities right away. No, they don't. If you think, if you, if you look at their actual activities, they do not fix vulnerabilities right away, and they don't have much interest in that. They have an interest in just in making you think that, uh, and they have, but they have an interest in, in fact, you buying an upgrade, which happens to fix a lot of vulnerabilities. Okay, so um, their, their interest is not to fix. Let's say there's a vulnerability that. Um, will bring the system down. Mm -hmm. or well, if it's a really dramatic one that people will be upset about, then they'll try to fix it. But if it's just an ordinary... No, no. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to talk about something very serious that will make people real upset. will bring the ATM down. Mm -hmm. if, if there is a vulnerability that will bring the ATM down, they have to fix it. Because the bank ain't going to buy any more software from Microsoft. Right. If, if the ATM stays down for a month. 
Right. Okay. But, but that's a different issue, and then I'm that's talking, then, about, I'm talking about this issue. Yeah, but that's I mean, okay. The, so Microsoft has an interest in fixing this kind of problem. Yes, which is quite separate from the interest though, that they have in fixing home users' problems. Okay. Now, what is the interest for the company or the group of people who maintain PHP? Mm -hmm. What is their interest in fixing a vulnerability in the PHP system? If, if there are several different kinds of interests. One is that they don't want to lose their reputation. Okay. Another is they don't want to get fired. Okay, because, because they're often, because often a lot of these people work, you know, for somebody, uh, and, and this is a, they work for somebody like IBM, or they work for whatever thing is, you know, open source insurance, but they work for Exxon, or they work for, you know, one of the big banks or whatever. Uh, and if they do bad work, uh, and it becomes very visible very fast. You have to fix it for your company, and once you've done that, you, if it's any good at all, you put it up. Yeah. And there's six guys that have fixed it for their company, and one of them did it better than the others. Yeah. And therefore, he, he can actually profit from this indirectly, because he, everybody will start saying, hmm, in he did a really world, good job. In your world, are you, you're aware of people that have done particularly good fixes for yes. things as they came up? Yes. We'll never, we'll never, we'll never hear about it, but it doesn't matter because it, you're not in this world. I mean, you know who good lawyers are, as a matter of fact. I would have to ask you. I haven't the foggiest idea. The only lawyer I know died a few years ago. Um, well, I actually know his part too. We publish things like that too. You know, we have a list of the best lawyers and, yes. and you know these sort of things. And yeah. Is there a hall of fame of uh, here, I, 2005? Here are the guys that. I don't know if it's published or not. I, I know at one point. This is word of mouth. This is a small world. It's a very small world. I, I know at one point five of the ten best programmers in the world were working for me. As it happened, they're actually being paid. I was actually writing the paychecks uh, in, in those days. Uh, that was when we were working on. You know, I think of GNU as being basically finished by about 1992, 93. GNU Linux, uh, whereas most people think it suddenly began sometime in the late 90s, yeah. because it, the, then it became, you know more user-friendly and all that sort of thing. Um, and it got widely used, it was one of these things. Um, what I think is happening now, what we're seeing is, we have this, like this viral issue. We have very smart PR people who take viral rather than vaccinate as words to be used, and this spreads throughout the world. We have, I've been personally attacked, not for being uh, in favor of competitive free markets, but in favor of uh, communism. Because I'm in favor of exactly the same rights that you have about law for a lot of other things that are also can't be dropped on your foot. You can't drop a law on your foot. You can drop a book on your foot, but not law. Likewise, you can drop a printed copy of the new general public license, but you can't drop the information of the new general public license. Uh, and so, oh, uh, so let's be in favor of the, the United States Constitution. Say, hmm. Well, that's obviously communist because the United States Constitution, what it's made up with, is, uh, uh, is information. And you can't drop it on your foot. You can only drop things that carry it that are printed, like printed copies of it. Uh, and that, let's see, so that's another clever bit of, of, of how you frame things. And you have very rich, influential, and smart people pushing that. And you have smart, but not necessarily smart in this way, because they're mostly backroom hacker types, and, um, going the other way. Uh, so, so you have you have a definite conflict going on, I mean, that's, um, and that's what we're seeing a lot of. So, um, pretty much um, paying, I mean, Microsoft paying, let's say Microsoft paying for its own people to develop its own products, and Microsoft is somehow... It's not paying its own people to do its own products. Remember, you, American taxpayers, paid for the network stuff that Microsoft did. They didn't pay, Microsoft did not pay for that. Yeah. American taxpayers paid I, I, for that. Okay. 
Now, and that's important to remember. I, I want to say something else. Let's say mm -hmm. Microsoft Bing is only employees. Okay? Yeah. On the other hand, Microsoft pays indirectly mm -hmm. this um, this programmers that write free software for other people. Okay. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Is it say like I pay for my for my house in a good neighborhood? Because I know that the value of my house will increase no. relatively good. No. And I pay for the park as well, because I know that if I have a good well, park to my home, that will still increase the value of my house. It's partly like that, it's partly not. I mean, some of the things like your house and the park are objects that are rivalrous, as an economist would say. In other words, if you have your house, somebody else can't use it okay. while you're using it. Okay. Uh, but if you and I both have well, a well, program, we can both use it. Okay, it's something like that. I have a house, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I can rent You can rent the, it. The, the, the first floor. That means I have my, my, my own software company and I can sell my software. On the other hand, I pay for the park, which everybody can use. But now, can On you the other hand, I pay for free software that everybody can use. Is this a good comparison? Well, well no. Because when you say you can sell your software, you're saying you can sell your software at a higher than a free market price only in the countries where they have good law enforcement. Okay. Uh, you cannot sell your software in a country like Malaysia okay. or China or Brazil, which I happen to know personally. You can. It costs about $1.50 to $2.50 to, to get 650 megabytes of whatever. Every, every program. Yeah. Uh, and that's what the competitive free market price is for manufacture, distribution, marketing, advertising, all that sort of thing, and make a profit for whoever does it. Well, the way you described it earlier, you know, far from I mean, really being anything connected with communism, it's it, not. Is, it is that all the people that are dependent on uh, a Microsoft, because mm -hmm. of just the way things shook out, it's in their great interest mm -hmm. to devote time of people that they've got on hand anyway mm -hmm. to producing a product that will that they will have a share in, even if everybody else has it too. Uh, it's no, it's not in their interest. It's in their interest to prevent, to have, to, to seed other people, which is the thing they've done. But it's not in their interest to have everybody do it, because if everybody can get it, then the price of getting copies has to go down. Because otherwise, for example, how can you sell Word uh, at a couple hundred dollars a shop if uh, everybody already has it? No, but not, well, yeah, well, you can upgrade it. But, but the companies that are not Microsoft, IBM, yeah. I, and, and, and other, uh, and, and my school, yeah. if my, if the, the, the guy at our school that does our network, if he was a, a really good programmer too, mm -hmm. but he happened to want to uh, right. uh, meet girls, so yeah. he's working at the school. Uh, and oh, it's with the street that I should mention that it's now officially over, but we can keep on talking. And he, and I say, okay, you're going to spend uh, 